Hello and welcome to Maiden Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Sophie Windsor, also known as Sophie Winkleman, British uh, actress, comedian, star of the iconic TV series Peep Show. We spoke, first of all, not about acting, but about children, about children being exposed to uh, smartphones from a young age, why so many schools seem to think that having loads of tech in the classrooms is a good thing, um, why children having access to porn is such a serious problem and why politicians need to act much more decisively on this question. And then in the extended part of the episode, uh, we spoke about acting, the effect that Me Too has had on the acting industry, what intimacy coordinators actually do on set, and uh, why sex scenes have become so much more explicit in recent decades and the effect that, that has on young actors and actresses just getting into the industry. That extended version of the podcast can be found at louiseperry.substack.com, where you can also find uh, the back catalogue, the extended episodes, the MMM chat community, and the bonus episodes that I do fortnightly with my husband. Enjoy. Okay, Sophie, can I start by being really cringe and telling you how much we love Peep Show in our households? Me and my husband, we probably, we probably quote peep show and the simpsons about an equal amount of time we have like a dozen peep show quotes that are just in circulation constantly in our household which is probably completely impenetrable to anyone who hasn't seen all of it several times <laughs> <laughs> i'm very happy to hear it it's very sweet how much joy peep show gives people especially a certain demographic of men actually um <laughs> it is actually m many more boys who come up to me just so excited it's terribly That's sweet <laughs> and it just I anything that makes people happy makes me happy I'm, I'm thrilled people like it and then euros tend to love two and a half men and I don't know if they'd get peep show but they they get sort of Germans and Italians especially go mental for two and a half men which is very very sweet but English people especially weirdly on the Isles of Scilly weirdly <laughs> where we go every year seemingly every person on the silly Isles only watches peep show and that's all <laughs> they do it's extremely funny i'm mainly 99 percent completely anonymous but in the silly Isles, i'm i'm truly like a bomb it's extraordinary <laughs> i i think that english people have more tolerance for the the cringe worthiness of the peep show humor that i'm i think I, i'm told by american friends that there is a there is a cult following of peep show in america but they find yes there they is, find the embarrassingness quite, quite quite, yeah, yeah yeah they 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 find it slightly painful to watch in like because it's because it's the same show yeah, we as like we like anything. humiliation yes. we like seeing people <laughs> yes yeah really suffer <laughs> we find it terribly funny <laughs> Um, I could talk about Pip Show all day, but I'm not going to. <laughs> we have a bunch of things to talk about, including first off, kids and tech, because your kids are, yes. I have one two-year-old, so we're kind of at the cusp of tech being a source of conflict in the house. He watches a little bit of yes. um, CBBS, and he insists That's sometimes, fine. he thinks that phones, smartphones, I apart from the fact that mummy and daddy look at them too often, that smartphones only exist to show him photos of himself. So he will demand to look at photos <laughs> sometimes because <laughs> nothing brings him more joy than looking at photos Perfect. of himself. Um, but apart from that, you know, we're kind of in the foothills of this, whereas obviously children who are a bit older, screens is quite a big issue, particularly in schools. Yes. Well, I think you're actually lucky to have such a little one because I think by the time he's eight, nine, ten, where the damage is setting in, I think there will be such insurmountable evidence that I think there will be a huge swing back to more traditional ways of entertaining and teaching children. Um, but till then, I think it's a massive issue inside the school and outside school. And, you know, a big sort of hurrah went up when Gillian Keegan said she was going to ban phones in the classroom. And to me, that seemed so obvious. I don't know why people were sort of making such a, this is a huge step forward. Why on earth were there phones in the classroom to start with? Um, so yeah, well done, but get on with it. Now stop them having social media before, I think they're 18, but I've been told to say 16 by lots of people because apparently 18 is far too extreme. You might have this, I mean, it's always an issue trying to get the 16 and 18 kind of things to line up. And if you ban social media until 18, you might have the perverse situation where someone could get married 
or join the military, but they couldn't post their wedding photos or their passing out parade photos on <laughs> social media, which would maybe not the That's probably true. I probably have to <laughs> stick to 16. I, my placards probably have to say 16. Um, though I don't think you can smoke legally till you're 18, can you? I don't think you can drive. Yeah, to, or, no, you can drive. Whoops, I shouldn't say that. Uh, well, you can start learning to drive when you're 17. So, there, I mean, there are a lot of right. things that which we're a bit inconsistent on. So maybe, yes. I mean, I, I think certainly, I, I'm long been of the opinion that we should treat social media like driving. We should say it's yeah. uh, it's clearly useful sometimes. It's something that we have to do. It's something that adults should be able to do and so on. But we should also, you ought to treat it with caution in the way that we do with driving. I agree. I just think it's making so many adults I know so wretched. I don't know why we think it's fine to let children sort of run riot around sort of the internet wilderness. Um, I think it's a huge dereliction of duty. Um, I don't know whether you want to start in the classroom or outside the classroom. Just direct me because I've got so much to say. I can waffle on in a very incoherent way. So just <laughs> plonk me on the right motorway. And let's, let's start outside the classroom. I mean, including thinking about two-year-olds and toddlers. I mean, I I am surprised by how common it is now to see toddlers sitting in their prams with an iPad. And in fact, that you can get iPads specifically designed for toddlers. That seems I do too, and very recent to me. I do too. And I, I say all this, Louise, without having any judgment on parents. Parents are knackered and they're, they're stressed and they're worried about everything. And if everyone else is doing it, why on earth wouldn't they entertain their toddler with an iPad for a lot of the day? It's not dangerous. Well, it's, it is dangerous, but he can't get killed doing it. So it's a sort of safe babysitting device, which is being, I think, terrifyingly overused. Um, I mean, toddlers should be sort of staring at a leaf in the park or they should be looking at a dog, or they should be looking at their mum's hair, or they should be finding tiny natural things fascinating. And they do if they don't get this crazy stimulation from a tablet. And it, it, it overwires their brains to a point where they can't find normal life interesting at all. And when you see parents t try and take devices away from little children, the outbreak of terror and horror is extraordinary to witness. There are so many awful videos of it. I think it shouldn't be legal to give a, a child an iPad. I think it's so strange now television is you know, in the 60s wasn't considered this awful, massive beast which was going to corrupt our young children's minds. That now seems so innocent and so fine. I think a child on a sofa watching a Peppa Pig is very, very different from having your own, being able to control your own world on a device that is so full of stimulation. Every time you sort of point at a tree it explodes into balloons. I mean, the brain is the brain is a very, very sensitive growing organ at that age. And machine gunning it with excitement is is really abusive. I'm very boring about this. Quite evangelical and can be dull. So you must keep <laughs> editing me and snipping me because well, I find well, it very don't... upsetting and I get over the top about it. <laughs> well, I mean, we know this is true for adults as well, don't we? Uh, on that point, though, about children looking at the natural world, my my mother-in-law recently saw, um, who is a paediatrician, saw a child out and about who was a three or something, who there was something on the floor the child wanted to look at. And um, instead of like getting closer, did this with their hand because that's <gasps> I know because that's what you God. do on a an iPad to zoom in right and I thought that was so that was so disturbing I mean I say that's this as someone really who disturbing. makes a living through screens and looks at screens far too much but I think that there's a recognition maybe more common among people who have been raised on screens to some extent as as, as say millennials have that that, that you that you, you need to ration them you need to have some self control that there are that you end up with that kind of tired sicky feeling if you spend too long looking at them and that actually it's quite bad for your eyes really bad for yeah. your eyes and no one talks about that i don't understand why that's at the bottom of the pile of concerns it's been it's been widely proven do you ever listen to andrew andrew huberman's podcast 
No, I don't. I still don't know how to play a podcast. <laughs> I'm that much of a tech moron. Okay. I genuinely don't know how to do it. Everyone asks me if I've heard the rest is politics and all these. I don't know what they're talking about. Go on. Well, Andrew Huberman is an um, American scientist who has a has a podcast and YouTube show. And um, my husband says that I'm terribly hubertarded. That's his word for it because I, I, I love Huberman and I do all of his. He has these sort of list of like, things you should do in your day to feel more energized and and happier and well rested and so on and uh, and they're things like going in cold plunge pools and and getting sunlight on your eyelids first thing in the morning and things like that but one of them which I think about a lot is that if you spend 90 minutes looking at a screen doing focused work you should then go and do something different with your eyes you should go and look at a look because the screen is at one distance from your eyes, right? And so you're, and so you end up kind of focused just on that specific distance. You should go and look in the distance, look closer, whatever. You should sort of exercise your eyes. And Absolutely, that's, I believe yeah. that because they're muscles, aren't they? And even yeah. more so for developing no, child's I eyes, that. I would imagine. Yeah. Well, there's been a sort of seventy five percent rise in the need for glasses for t- for teenagers. There's really? there's a sort of massive skyrocketing of myopia. Um, that's that's a, yeah, from that... I think Spec Savers. I've got so many yeah, lists of stats yeah. everywhere. I don't know if it's from them or Sight Savers. I can't remember. Sorry, um, but the 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 impact of endless blue light on eyes is incontestable. Um, among all the other harms, you're absolutely right. And when you say, you know, you're you're doing wonderful work, you know, on screen and through a digital medium. Um, but you've grown up being able to focus and concentrate and think without the distraction and short circuiting that, you know, screens do to young minds. And that's why you can create a fantastic career now. I don't know if you'd have been able to do it if you were TikToking away from the age of 10. I don't know if your brain mm, would have be fried my brain. capable of I'm, sustained thought. I don't I'm think so pleased that I read loads of classic novels when I was a teenager, when one, I had so much time on my hands, and two, I could still concentrate on something like a long, difficult exactly. novel. Because, yeah, no, it really is true that the, the internet in particular encourages you to do this kind of flicking with your brain. Which makes it almost impossible to and sustain attention. And short circuiting, attention. it can't, yeah. it can't, it, even mine can't. Mine can't focus anymore, and I'm more obsessed with this than anyone I know. If I start, you know, reading something that requires a little bit of concentration, I can feel my brain start flickering after a few minutes. Thinking, gosh, should I reply to that person? No, they'll be all right. Okay, carry on. I mean, I, I, it's really frightening, and it's a real thing. It's, and I do not think it should be happening in the school either I know I shouldn't go back to the school thing I've got no so no, no. Much let's talk, talk let's talk let's talk about start. schools because the the impression not yet having a school-aged child but the impression that I get is that schools will boast about how much tech they have available to children in schools exactly they don't seem to think it's it's, risky it's a point of pride for many junior school heads and definitely senior school to point out the tech provision before anything else, before what, you know, and and a a lot of parents who are getting a bit savvy about this, rather than asking their sort of primary school head, what are the set texts you read? What's your music like? um, What's your art department like? They say, now what's going on with the tech? There, There aren't many of us. There aren't. I think it's still widely accepted that children have to you know, get digital savvy to get in the real world, which is so stupid. It's like saying they should run along in the road to get used to it for when they're older. It's very, it's not a persuasive argument. Um, I think the tide might be turning the tiniest bit, I hope. Um, But I've moved my children three times now because the schools have suddenly swallowed the tech Kool-Aid and sent out very excited messages in the summer holidays saying from next year we will be giving all the pupils their own tablets and we will be fully signing on to Atom Learning Um, and it's a mark of it's a sign to me that I need to leave because it's 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 not a good way to learn. It stokes the screen addiction. It normalizes screen use. After sort of homework, you get games. So a, ch- a very young child, a seven-year-old, can be on a screen doing their homework and then on games for a very long time after school. Let alone all the hours they've spent in school. And there's no there's no monitoring of this. There's no 
how much is safe yet. Sweden have realised um, that it's it's a disastrous way for children to learn. They're ahead of us on the curve of so many things. They really inspect things rather than getting all excited like we tend to do in other countries. And they've said that writing in a book and having that book, having a, a series of essays in a book, you remember what it was like. You'd sort of see the evolution of your handwriting. You'd It would be a lovely memento of a year's learning. Um, you don't have that anymore. You sort of type things out on one thing and then go to another subject and it's all in one massive wobbly eye cloud, which means nothing. Uh, and it's a horrible way to learn. The physical presence of a book is very important um, and actually handwriting out things you've learned it requires a discipline that cut and paste on a screen really doesn't. You have to make sure you know what you're going to say. You can't sort of suddenly wipe it all out and start again. It's It requires a firm muscle in ways that just clicking away is a shallow way of learning and it doesn't. I'll tell you, I do quite a lot of writing longhand. I have I have a, a tablet um, called a Remarkable, which is like a handwriting. You can you can you can write on it as if hand as if you were writing on paper and it really feels like you're writing on paper and then it will um translate it into text to you and and e- email it to yourself and it's partly because it's a way of um uh not using an internet enabled device so it's a way of avoiding distraction during work hours but also it's it is different to write longhand it does mostly because it forces you to think sequentially. Whereas if you're writing it on a word processor, you, you know that you can cut and paste. And so it's a completely different. And I mean, when I was at a school and university, I don't know if this is still true. Your exams would be done longhand. So if you didn't yes, of course. know how to write like and that, that requires, you'd be completely Exactly. Promised. It requires a discipline of, it requires a discipline of thinking about structure and, reasoning and sense and conclusion in ways that it re- you really don't need to have that if you're just typing away the the computer will take care of any errors you can sort of switch things around it's it's it doesn't require the same kind of focus and the same kind of skill are there schools so the only type of school i can think of and have thought of actually as a potential school for for our children that isn't really um, into tech is is our Steiner schools and some other kind of alternative schools. Um, and they've been around for ages in one form or another. Um, but are there, do you, do you see any signs of kind of tech free schools becoming a thing, particularly I'm thinking of private schools where, you know, if parents really, really don't want the tech that they can actually um, sort of put their money where their mouths are and, and, and choose an alternative? Or is there a gap in the market? <laughs> I think there's a huge gap in the market and it's something I've been looking at for the past year and a half because I found a school um, in Cambridge which does exactly what I think every parent would want for their child. It's four to 16, it's non-selective, it's in a little townhouse, it's run by a married couple. Um, it's it's completely screen-free apart from a couple of hours of IT in you know on a Friday morning. So all the other subjects apart from you're you're completely digitally literate by the time you leave but you're not digitally dependent that's the difference mm-hmm. they do a huge amount of latin greek shakespeare classical music they engender a knowledge of the great artists it's a really intellectual beautiful curriculum they've come up with but as i say it's non selective so it's not super you know hugely bright tutored children it's not like that at all and it's not hugely expensive they've just realized that if they teach a certain way, they can set the bar extremely high and all the children re- reach it. Um, the lessons are quite gentle, but really thoughtful. And because the children aren't tapping away on screens and completely distracted, uh, they can really focus. It's utterly brilliant. It's based on a method of education designed by a turn of the century educationalist called Charlotte Mason, um, who was who thought that the greatest gift you could give to a child was the ability to focus and think about something for a relatively long time proportionate to your age. Um, so an art lesson, um, they give they give the children, say, a Turner, a little fo- colour photocopier of a, a Turner painting, for example, and the children look at it for 10 minutes in complete silence. This is sort of six-year-olds that I saw when mm. I went there. And then they take the painting away. This is an art lesson. It's divided into three sections 
And then they ask the children for 10 minutes what they noticed about the painting. And the children say, well, I noticed the way the light hit the water there. And I noticed that he did that blue bit of water in much darker colour here. So it looked lighter over there. And they'd really have to notice how this scene was being evoked by the artist. And then the final 10 minutes, they had to reproduce it with their own little paints or, or watercolours, pe pencils. And it was such an extraordinary way to teach art. It was just about noticing and thinking and then trying to recreate. And all their lessons are similarly thoughtfully designed. I mean, they're, they're sort of, I saw seven-year-olds translating the Iliad and finding it so fun. It was like a couple of grown-ups doing a cryptic crossword in the pub. They found it so exciting. Um, so I think, there actually is going to be a big appetite for schools like this um, when people, when the press get hold of the fact that we're not doing our children a good service, shoving them in front of screens. It is not cutting edge. It's not what Silicon Valley do. It's not going to fast track your children into fantastic fintech jobs. It's going to deplete their brain power. Uh, when people realise this, I, which I hope people like you will make happen very soon. I think there'll be a massive appetite for them. Um, in, I mean, already in California, we li I lived in California for six years, and the really brainy, deep mind people send their children to screen-free schools. It's a sort of well-kept secret. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg went to the, um, uh, the uh, is it called the Exeter um, Andover School, which is completely screen-free. Um, there's a place called the Waldorf um, Peninsula School uh, in Silicon Valley. There are tons of them. And they realise the people who are designing the rubbish that our children are being given every day, they're realising it's a disaster for their own children. Yeah, they know something that we clearly don't, yes. <laughs> You yeah. know, they also get the, some of these Silicon Valley uh, executives, they also get nannies to sign contracts saying that they won't use their phones in front of the children and things like that. And they don't give their children Amazing. smartphones until they're quite no. old. No, of course yeah. they don't. Till they're sort of 16. I know yeah. Steve Jobs and the Twitter man, yeah. they, they kept them well away from them. Yeah. So it's sort of scandal, actually. And it should be, yeah. I'm sure they realise that one of the the, the 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 failure of this principle that you should learn how to use this tech in school so that you can then, you know, leave school digitally literate, is that tech changes so quickly. I mean, whatever tech I was, I, I did a bit of this at school, thinking about a secondary school learning how to use particular types of software, um, which now is completely outdated, and I've never used those skills <laughs> like as an adult because tech moves yeah, so fast. That's absolutely true. It's a really good point. Whereas learning how to focus clearly is is that's a lifelong thing that you can adapt to any kind of circumstance. That's that's the skill that um, learning on atom learning and century tech, which so many London private schools have swallowed with great gusto without really inspecting it. Um, and one of the heads I spoke to when I was doing a piece about this a few months ago said it was making his students worse at certain subjects. It was feeding them the wrong information. They were learning it superficially anyway. And he said they had to have a big sort of emergency stop. Um, I mean, none of this stuff has been examined properly and the effects of how children are learning. Getting all your GCSE results and A-level results as a result of lots of digital learning, same at university, and then you get a great job, which has been the trajectory all along, which requires you to think deeply in a crisis. Lots of young people are being fired after about six months. It's a sort of silent e epidemic when they're sort of scaffolding of knowing how to sort of game the system on these rubbishy platforms fails them in a real life situation where they have to invent and they have to collaborate and they have to think deeply around a problem. They can't do it. Um, and I think when this when this explosion comes out, which I think it will, as you say, there will be a... What I don't want to happen is for traditional learning methods to be seen as fusty or regressive in some way. They're simply much more effective. And it's been proven, I mean, Sweden have seen it, and it's been proven in the schools I visited where tech is used with, you know, serious moderation. The results are spectacular. The children are much calmer and happier. Um, and the atmosphere is so much lovelier because learning on a tablet 
in a classroom is such an isolating, miserable way to learn. Uh, in the Heritage School in Cambridge, in Catherine Burble Singh's school, she she views tech with huge scepticism, and and she's right. Her her lessons her lessons are like discos. They're so fun, and the children and the teachers have direct arteries between them, all of them, and the te- the little kids' eyes never leave the teacher, who's the sort of rock star at the front, and. The teacher engages them constantly with lots of questions. It's all really human and really exciting. And it's the opposite of how these geeks who've sold us this way of living because it suits them, the weirdo in the classroom in the old days, is now determining how normal people live their lives. And it's why all of us are mis- malfunctioning. It's it's much more effective. I've seen it for myself. Catherine Burble Singh is a real, who is... um. Uh, anyone listening who doesn't know, Catherine Burblesing is um, a headmistress of uh, the Michaela School in Northwest London. It's not in a fancy part of London, right? It's it's and it's a state school. Doesn't there are no fees, so the children are. are I think it's I think it's majority ethnic minority students as well, maybe super majority, um, and they get such good results, such good academic results. She's famously the the strictest headmistress in in Britain. Is her sort of um, she is, and when, when you when you yeah. go to her school multiple times, as I have, and you get to know her, you realise her discipline is a form of huge love for these children, and she's giving them a scaffolding and a structure which maybe they don't all have at home. And when you give a child a structure like that, the shoots and the leaves start to sp- sort of blossom. Um, and she is very sceptical of tech and she's she's the sort of, I think, the goddess of British education because she's taken um, lots of children who might not do nearly as well in an average state school. And she's made them just, you know, they're, they're little meteors. They're doing spectacularly. And I think anyone anyone who doesn't buy all what we're saying should just go to the school she's incredibly welcoming she wants people to see it and she wants people to roll out her model and it would be wonderful for all the children in our country state school private school she's got a model that really works and they know things it's knowledge based it's not just chatting about how you're feeling which is happening in a lot of you know a level syllabuses now i don't know how it's allowed but that she arms them with knowledge she arms them with you know, how to be a civilised human, but they're much more polite, her children, than most of the very lucky little sods I know. They're really delightful, engaged and curious. And anyway, I mustn't go on about her. I'm a, I'm a massive girl fan of hers. <laughs> um, she's not universally popular in the sort of teaching world. I think, And I think that's partly because she does show up, you know, the fact that she has gone, she has transformed. I agree at least one school, you know, really demonstrating that this works, um, does, it, it is kind of, she, she, she has, she has, she has performed proof of concept in a way that is annoying for people who uh, don't like her concept. I find that small of them, because if you can help a huge swathe of Britain's children um, by sort of emulating someone's very thoughtful vision of how a school should be run why on earth wouldn't you do it and that's typical britain being sour at someone's success rather than going along and saying hey how do i do this which actually probably americans would having lived in both countries <laughs> i now realize what different planets we are and that's not saying that all america is good at all there were lots of awful things about it but they celebrate success in ways that england really doesn't we can't bear it I, I, this might be an Australian expression, tall poppy syndrome, where as soon as a poppy yes, grows tall, exactly. you, yeah, I, I think we have that in spades in, in Anglo culture, which is why it's a, um, which is why the Australian expression comes from. Um, there's really a very strong, I was just reminded of something that uh, I read Rob Henderson, uh, the, uh, the psychologist talking about a little while ago, when he had spoken to a teacher 
who had who had taught in schools where the where phones were freely available in the classroom the kids could do whatever they wanted with their phones and he said what you noticed was that the kids who were getting a grades were kind of self-disciplining without without any external need for discipline so they would put their phones in their lockers because they knew that if they had the phone available to them they, they would be distracted so they they kind of they 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 um impose that restriction on themselves the kids who were getting sort of b's and c's would have the phones in their bags on the floor next next to their desk and would periodically check it and then the kids who were not doing well at school at all they had the phones on their desks and they were just constantly distracted by the phones and it occurred to me that there's a very there's a very good really egalitarian argument for saying not everyone has the ability to self-regulate with with screens. Some people are more easily addicted to them than others. Some people are more conscientious than others, just kind of... I agree, and they're the more vulnerable ones. Exactly, and find it really hard to impose those limits on themselves. So if the school or the parent or the community or, or the government or whatever imposes those restrictions instead, then you somewhat even the playing fields in terms of conscientiousness. I totally agree. And I think experiments like that can work in certain settings, but it sounds like... That was probably done in maybe quite a sort of posh private school. It sounds like a, definitely a kind of woolly liberal thing to try out. And the children who have lots of, you know, ambition can do it themselves. But I don't think that will, I don't think that would be a widespread success. I really don't. I think sometimes grown ups don't, shouldn't be scared of just imposing stuff that will keep their children safe and well developing for as long as they can. That's what parents are for. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, also, this is a plague that uh, social media anyway, it's a plague that doesn't discriminate because many children in affluent liberal situations are, you know, torridly torpedoing downwards because the parents want to be their friends and they don't want to say put that wretched thing away because they haven't got that kind of relationship. Um, To the children whose parents are not around and not available and not present, they're also, you know, hugely malfunctioning. So I think for children in general, we need to grow some balls. Sorry to say it like that, but Britain seems to have lost them. And I think it, I think it needs to say this. I, 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 I don't believe social media has a single upside for below 16s. I really don't. They say they sort of paint it as this huge connector. It's not. It makes people really lonely. And children don't see each other outside school as as much. They're not in a room chucking pillows at each other or giggling or sort of being in a sort of physical, fun friendship with each other. They're just panicking about stuff they haven't been invited to, panicking about the fact that the cool girl didn't like one of their jokes. They're, They're panicking all the time. And they're panicking that they don't look good on Instagram. They're panicking they're, you know, not getting any sort of feedback from the class WhatsApp group. They're panicking because their TikTok video didn't get as many likes as that other girl from that group. And there's no upside. I really believe that. And it's not a connector, it's an isolator. There's a particular kind of political push towards being very liberal with children and and, and not just with screens, but with everything and allowing them to make decisions as adults would, even though they are not yet adults. And it reminded me of... It's a bit cheeky to talk about this publicly, but the, a guy at my gym who I know slightly, who's a fair bit older than me, and this is in a very kind of bougie part of London, okay? Um, he was t- telling this story to um, me and several other people at the gym, like it was a very funny story about how his, I think his 16 year old girl has a, daughter, has, a, has a boyfriend and the boyfriend would come and stay over at their house overnight. And then the boyfriend was coming down to breakfast in the morning topless. And the oh. dad was, and the, and the parents just didn't say anything, right? And the dad was telling this, and like it maybe slightly self-deprecating tone, but he was telling this <laughs> as if this was a funny story. And I was like, and I was like, I don't want to out myself here. I, I use my married name at the gym. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not public in, in these contexts about my yeah. <laughs> insane political views. But Did I was you like, gently tell him to... I didn't dare. I didn't dare. I thought, Did you not? oh my goodness, what that young man is saying, and it's a terrible red flag, is he's disrespecting you in your own kitchen. He's saying, yeah, I hugely. just shagged your daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're just, and you're just letting so him do it. That's excruciating. 
You're letting him do it. It's bad for yeah. everyone involved. How is yeah. that going to work? Oh, that's awful. Poor man. I mean, I say I'm I'm talking like this, like I'm I must be some perfect mother. I'm awful. I'm incredibly lazy. I can't be bothered to do all sorts of activities you're meant to do with the children. I just want there to be structures in place so that my mm. indolence with them means they draw pictures and read books rather than go on Snapchat with their friends and wreck their brains. I want to be able to have a sort of cosy home life where I know they're getting up to something quite sweet rather than something hugely destructive. And I think that should be the same for all parents. And I actually do think we need either a massive parental revolution or government help. I do. I think it's got to that point. I honestly think parents would be so relieved if the government just banned, say, so smartphones for under I 16s. totally agree. Yeah. You can, have a, you can have a brick phone, that's fine. If parents... I always find it strange when parents say, oh, I'm too worried about Layla going on the tube to school, so I'm giving her a smartphone she's much less likely to be abducted on the tube than she is to be groomed by a total stranger. So why don't you give her a flip phone or a light phone or an old Nokia phone and she can text you saying she's at school or she can ring the police, that's all they need them for. Or she, and she can text individual friends, that's totally fine. An individual chat is quite sweet. It's when things get to a herd level um, like what, like WhatsApp. I mean, I didn't know how bad WhatsApp was till I spoke to some teachers um, and realised the terrible teen explosions that happen overnight on WhatsApp. Um, I thought that was the most vanilla of all of them, but apparently not. Uh, I think parents would be relieved too. They don't want to stop their child joining in because it's a serious teen biological need to fit in with their peers. Uh, and they don't want to be the social leper. Of course they don't. Um, but a lot of them do it incredibly sadly. And I've, I've, I've got friends with older children and they all turn into sort of enemies. I mean, the child's upstairs in the bedroom not coming down and the parents look a bit beaten and a bit resigned. These are parents who've poured every ounce of love into their children and done everything right until the beast of the Internet came into their lives and they've lost them. And it's 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 happening everywhere, all over the place. And I think we need to get tough now. There are now these phones you can get. I think they're called, um, or one brand of them is called Light Phones, which are sort of yes, designed I've to heard be about them. They're doing phones really well. for adolescents. Right, so they don't, they're not internet enabled at all. So they let you call a few numbers, but they don't text, they don't take photos. They're basically just a kind of safety device. Although a point that I heard from a mum of teenagers, which I thought was a, a very a very good point, was that if you, sometimes parents can think that can use the phone as a crutch and they can allow their children to do things which actually are a bit risky, but they think, oh, well, they've got their phone, so it's okay. And the point she made was actually, if you wouldn't allow them to do X, Y, Z without their phone, you shouldn't allow them to do it full stop because their phone could run out of battery, the phone could get lost, the phone could get stolen. You know, if you don't trust them to actually go go to that party or travel on that tube line or whatever without their phone, then they shouldn't be allowed to do it at all. It's not they probably it. shouldn't be doing it with the phone either. One of the other things that I find really disturbing about the tech explosion in schools. And it's something that I didn't quite experience because I was a sort of a little bit too old. We didn't have smartphones until I was 18, 19. So I was basically leaving school is, um, is sexual bullying at schools is things like using, it's not only kids watching porn because they've got the, the personal devices. It's also, you know, upskirting photos or sharing revenge porn or showing girls images in schools or whatever to, to basically intimidate them. There's like absolute horror stories that come out. And, you know, we, we all know that obviously teenagers can be horrible to each other and always have been, but it seems as though this kind of tech enabled stuff takes it to, it's taking it to another, level. another level. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. It's horror film stuff's happening. I've heard about it too. And I think, France have now banned under 18s from accessing any kind of porn in a very, very effective way with some kind of ID code. And apparently it's watertight and very impressively done. Um, and if France, the sort of most sex loving country in the planet, see the, you know, porn's not sex. It's 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 horror. Most of the stuff our children are seeing. Um, 
and it is becoming a tool in mixed schools especially of of intimidation and humiliation on a whole different level and it's making girls you know um Jean Twenge said something like self-harm among 10 to 14 year olds um has quadrupled in the last 10 years that's among such young children not that that's necessarily to do with the porn though it's happening younger and younger um we have to we have to ban porn for for teenagers they're they're beginning to not be able to be turned on by normal interaction between girls and boys because they're used to seeing such extreme imagery so violence in a in a sexual setting is now completely normal girls feel they have to put up with it to sort of not be embarrassed by the boy you know the next day and i think girls think it's sort of feminist to offer themselves immediately um, which, as you've said, makes them feel horrendous afterwards. And nobody's winning from the porn plague. And that's something else that we have to grow balls about and stop our young children being decimated by emotionally and mentally. I mean, I just find it amazing how often you'll hear, um, I mean, typically from adults who are sort of well beyond this 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 um, this risk themselves, but the idea that having access to online porn is some sort of human right, as if we, it's incredibly novel technology that no one had access to, you know, until maybe 20 years ago, vast majority of human history, we basically just had access to drawings or our imaginations, right, which is fine. I'm not intending to ban either yeah. of those things. But th- yeah. like, this is, so, this is so novel. And I think exposing adolescents to it, or even younger kids to it, is 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 using them like guinea pigs basically and 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 it seems to me that the precautionary principle should say that we should just we should just do everything we can to not permit children access to this until we have evidence that it's not harmful but the default assumption should be that it probably is harmful and anecdotal evidence definitely suggests that it is harmful absolutely i i know a friend who's in the comedy world i don't know if he's written about it so i can't say his name but he was exposed to his dad watching it wasn't even violent porn it was just normal porn when he was about eight and it's disturbed him in ways that he sort of it's not just a sexual thing it's disturbed him about life in general and made his wires go wrong in ways he's very um what's the word eloquent about when you're with him um but it's deeply disturbing for a, a minor to see sex it is and the stuff they're now seeing now is on a whole new planet of depravity uh and it's going to make a whole generation of really malfunctioning very mentally ill angry screwed up scared people and i don't think my rhetoric is over the top i don't i think if you just read one of gene twenge's books or jonathan Haidt's books i don't think any adult with a heart would say that this stuff can should be accessible to children to under 18s I think but as you say that's difficult under 16s get rid of it all porn social media smartphones just uh, unlimited internet access it's it's all it's all damaging and it's abusive to carry on letting it happen it's it's a major dereliction it's not even a dereliction of duty it's actively abusive because we know what it's doing to children now so not doing anything is abusive and i would say that to all the politicians you have to have an emergency meeting about this you have to do as france has done they've been led the way on the porn thing and do it with social media as well i have had so many experiences of um of speaking about this publicly and having um particularly mums of teenagers, dads too, but mums more often, who'll pull me aside afterwards and say, I am so worried about this. I'm so distressed by this. I think that the, and I I can't remember the numbers now, but I've read polling on what the British public think about um, children having access to porn. And and, uh, like, it's hard to come up with any issue on which the British public are more unanimous. I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's partly, well, there is, there is definitely some um, willingness within Parliament. It's partly a technological issue, I guess. It's how exactly do you, do you, do you um, design the right restrictions? Although, as you say, other countries have, have managed it. Um, It's also, I think, a fear of, you know, some people think that if you ban under 16s 
say, from accessing parts of the internet, you know, next step is to ban other citizens from doing, adult citizens from doing the same. And I say, yes, but I also think that the, you know, the, the costs here are very, very the high. The upsides are too to the great. the psychological to... well-being. Yeah, exactly. I think that, I think that, I think we have to take this more seriously than we have until recently. And, you know, part of it's just keeping pace with the te- change of technology, even, even within five years, things change really quickly on this front. So it's partly just, it's also, you know, a bunch of like elderly MPs who just don't really, <laughs> you know, they don't really know Get about it. any of this stuff. Yeah, no, they don't, bless them. And uh, that's why I keep, you know, banging this drum incessantly in the hope that they might, they might take it a bit more seriously. Well, I also think there's something in the British sort of national personality, which has always been a bit rubbish about children, whether it's putting them up chimneys in Dickens's time to terrible aristocratic neglect. I think there's something very British about seeing children as a sort of pest. Um, and ev- and it's not a poverty thing because you see poverty in Latin America and Africa and the children aren't harrowed like a lot of British children are. And as I say, it's not a poverty thing. It's it's a sort of widespread, strange thing in our personalities where we see kids as just lesser than us rather than little people to be sort of really venerated and taken great care of. Um, and that maybe is why it hasn't taken precedence in Parliament or in much national conversation, because we don't think children are as important as we should do. And that's something that has to change as well. I was at something the other day um, with Catherine Burblesing. It was it was about uh, a film called The Sound of Freedom, I think. Oh, yes. I've not seen it, but I've heard about it. it was called that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the yes. title, I think. And it was about child sex slavery and the huge proliferation of it all over the place, thanks in no part to the dark web, which is also could be disbanded very quickly if any of these people cared about it, but it makes too much money. Um, and she said, we just don't care about children. It's it, Maybe it isn't just a British thing. It's just, I think it is more British than other nationalities, oh. but she's done something in her school which has made the lives of the children she takes care of exponentially better. And instead of saying, let's have a look at what Catherine's doing and see where we can put it in other schools and she's willing to do a huge training programme, the you know our society hurls rotten apples at her saying she's strict and horrible and we attack her. And I find that very sad. And I don't know if that's just a tall poppy thing or a we can't be bothered to make children's lives better thing or whether it overlaps but I think it's a huge national problem we have to address and it's not just because the children are the future that's a sort of naff expression it's because children are precious and vulnerable and if we don't look after them we can't call ourselves a civilized society and I think we'd all like to call ourselves that. I've often thought that it's because well it's not just because but I think that we have a a uh, an underrepresentation of mothers in public life and in parliament in particular for the sort of straightforward reason that having um having a career and being a mother is quite difficult simultaneously and you will you will normally end up um either dropping out entirely or slowing down your career progression which means that you don't end up with as many the women who do get to the top of the tree in organizations are disproportionately likely not to have children and also it's often men who are at the top of these organizations and and it's not that women who don't have children or 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 men who may be fathers or not you know it's not that they don't care about issues relating to children but they don't tend to have that kind of like they just don't have a voice i think mothers have a particular i mean i certainly found from having a child that it kind of changed my moral universe i just suddenly cared so much more not only about my child, but also about children in general, like, you know, on a really, really visceral way, anything that any, any harm to children became more upsetting by a factor of about a hundred once I'd had my own. Well, I think we need to make ourselves heard. I think you're right. It is a fire in the belly thing. And it's happened to me as well in that I can't hear stories. I I still think about Madeleine McCann's parents. I think about them regularly Mm. thinking the horror. I was just thinking about them yesterday. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And you're right, because yeah. we do take a 
relative beating career-wise if we take time out or want to get back for four o'clock for school time and it still doesn't quite work. There aren't enough of Mm. our voices in the public sphere, I completely agree, and that's got to change. The episode is not over. There is another maybe 30 minutes of content, but it is behind a paywall. If you would like access to that content, if you would like to show support for the show, pay subscriptions are what keep it on the road. Allow me to pay my producers, put food on the table, all that important stuff. The extended version of the podcast is available at my substack, louiseperry.substack.com. That's where you can also find, as I say every week, bonus episodes, extended episodes, uh, the MMM chat community, all of this. Um, please sign up for a pay subscription. It makes such an enormous difference to my ability to keep producing the podcast and grow it even bigger, produce more episodes, all that good stuff. There are other ways that you can show your support for the show as well. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can like us on YouTube. You can tell your friends and family uh, how much you like the show. If you find it valuable, all of these things make an enormous difference to our ability to keep making it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.